Today, we're going to look at um, the substance and the evidence. I told you two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, or some weeks ago, I told you a while ago that I was going to show you where Paul got his uh, definition of faith, and it came out of the tabernacle. And so today, we are going to, uh, to look into that. And uh, see uh, exactly how God discerned faith and then how Paul took that faith and defined it for us so that we could understand it. And so uh, if you will stand with me for the reading of God's word. Thank you, praise team, for your, for your work. We had uh, uh, additional musicians. We're gaining in musicians every week. And uh, we've got new guitarists and people doing things that we, I didn't know they could do. But all I can say is, you the man. <laughs> Amen. Here's the reading of the word. We're going to read two scriptures. They're both in front of you there. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. And then in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 12 and he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. I pray today that you would open our eyes that we could see, and our ears that we could hear, and our heart that we could understand what the word of God is saying to us, and then allow us to apply it to our lives. God, what we need is the application of your word. What we need is the understanding of your word. God, I pray today that the Holy Spirit would speak to us as he always does, and we surrender ourselves to the Spirit of God so that the word of God can come forth, not out of our mind, but out of our spirit, because it is only through our spirit that we will be changed. Bless us now through the word in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you as you're being seated. Now, today I want to show you how faith has become the ingredient that must be released in order for us to be ushered into the presence of God. Now, everything that I've been teaching, and I guess it started in August, and preaching has been on your opportunity to approach God in your own prayer life. What I have found out as I have traversed the tabernacle is, is that God has a prescribed methodology for you to get into His presence. If you do not come that way, then what you are relying on is God to operate in mercy and miracles. But if you do come that way, then you can come through the thing that pleases God, which is faith. So today we're going to look at that. First, let's look at the significance of the incense itself. Now, this is going to be a revelation to you. The significance of the incense itself and what it presented as it trundled upward. There's something very significant in the way God does things and how He exudes faith. The influence itself, the spices. Now, I've read to you the first part of this. Did you see it in Leviticus 16, 12? They took coals, and the coals came from the brazen altar. And the coals were the coals that were covered in the blood. The blood of the sacrifice was what they put in the censer that, they, that Aaron in the morning carried into the holy place. And there he continually built the altar of incense so that it would burn. Then he, now notice this, nobody comes to God under any means unless He comes through the blood. Hallelujah. You will never get to God by any means until you come 
through the blood. The very first thing that happened in the tabernacle was the shedding of blood. The thing that gave you the opportunity to know Christ and to be able to come to God, the thing that made you accepted in the blood, the thing that made you the child of God was believing upon the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So, Aaron brought in his censer the coals from the burning altar, the brazen altar, where the sacrifices had been shed. And we've looked at that and thought for years, yes, and so God smelled the blood. And that's a partial truth. Because the incense were made up of four things. Specific. They had specific meaning both to God and the believer. Now I want you to get this. They had specific meaning to God but they also had specific meaning to the believer. That means you. Exodus 30, 34, let's look at it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices. And then it begins with this stepti. That's the first one. This spice represents, it is a good, uh, oozing spice. And it represented the oozing blood that came from the sacrifice. So when that was added into the altar of incense, it represented the blood of Jesus Christ. Then there was Onicha. The spice represented the lion that the cross would produce as a judge. And Galbanum this spice represented the earthly lamb, the man, Jesus Christ, that was offered and bled for the redemption of all mankind. And then, these three spices were to be put together with frankincense. This spice represented the king that was to come from the future sacrifice that God had in His divine plan. Did you know that those four spices had already been seen in the tabernacle. Huh? Where did it, where were they? We never heard about this before. You took us from David. You took us through the gate. You took us through the brazen altar. You took us through the labor. You brought us into the temple of blessing. You showed us the lampstand. You showed us the showbread. Now you're at the altar of incense. Not one time did you mention that there were any spices anywhere in this tabernacle. But I did. Because in the spices, if you will recall, the outer gate represented Jesus Christ. Did not the outer gate represent Him as the Son of Man? The earthy spice? Did not the outer gate represent Him as the Son of God? The lion? Did not the outer gate represent Him as the substitute? The blood? Did not the, the fencing, the inner, the way in that they called the way represent Him as the King? He was already represented to Israel in all four officers. When they got to the altar of incense and the spice mixed with the blood came out of there, God began to smell Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords that was coming into the world to be the sacrifice for all mankind so that man could know Him. When that smoke trundled out of the tabernacle, let me tell you, the believer was seeing the smoke of the Son of Almighty God. They saw it in the gate. Now they have it in the smoke. The gate was in one place, but the smoke went everywhere. Glory to God. Think about that. The gate was stationary, but the smoke of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the blood of the Lamb and the roaring judgment of the Lion and the substitute that was Jesus Christ who would become King waffled over the entire 
captain of Israel so that they knew that God was the Jehovah Shammah and God was there. I'm telling you today that Jesus Christ is here and he is there and he lives in me and I smell the sweet savor of a king in my life. Glory to God. The process of the altar of incense then is dealing with the prayer of the people. Now you will never pray. Prayer will never be had unless you have faith. Amen. Someone said, well everybody and anybody can pray. What they're telling you is, is they believe in a God. Mm -hmm. Everybody and anybody can pray. They're telling you that they have expressed and exhibited a faith. Now watch this now. The process of the order of the incense then is dealing with the prayers of the people as well as the faith by which is being released. Revelations 8, 3, and 4 deals with how God handles those prayers. And look at verse 4. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints. When God hears the child of God pray, do you know what he is smelling? He's smelling the blood. He's smelling the sacrifice. He's smelling the lamb. He's smelling the son of God that is the judge. And he is smelling the king that is seated at his right hand and ever lives to pray for you. What a beautiful thing. So from what foundation do we pray? Prayer is made from the foundation of faith. The smoke bears our foundation, as I'll show you shortly. Now watch this next thing. Faith is the key component that everything that has divine, of everything that has divine expression. So do you have in your life a divine expression? Do you have a divine expression? Because you can't pray without it. What are you saying to me, Pastor? If you don't know Jesus Christ through the blood, through the King, through the Lamb, you don't have a divine expression. You must understand who and what you're praying to. He must be your source. He must be your foundation. Because that is what God is looking into in your life. It is not just, okay, I have a need, so I'm going to pray. That need is not going to be met until the foundation of the spices are rolling through the smoke that brings your prayer to God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now the Bible said we are saved by grace through faith. Without faith in the four offices, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Substitute and the King, we will never be able to get our prayers any higher than the ceiling under which we pray them. God has developed and shown us this in the tabernacle. Psalms 142. Here's what it says. We find the writer in deep prayer. His heart is burdened. He is heavy laden. The events of his life have encompassed him. And he is downhearted. But then we go to Psalms 143. In Psalms 143, something changed. And all of a sudden, he begins to seek and find the face of God. Because he is meditating. Now watch what he said. He meditated on the works of old. What works of old were they? They were the works that he knew about. Where were they? They were the works of the temple. He found the methods of worship and praise that were revealed in the temple. And in Psalms 142, life was hard. In Psalms 143, he found the works of old that changed his life. In other words, he found the coal of blood. He found the spice.
spice of the blood. He found the spice of the earthy man that was the lamb. He found the spice of the king. He found the spice that would come up before God and be a smoke in the nostril of God. And God then recognized it. Huh? God saw it and said, yes, 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 I, I know what that is. That's the smoke of the prayer of faith. Psalm 143, 7 said, Hear me speedily, O Lord. My spirit far faileth. Hide not thy face from me. This is what was promised in the holy place as the word would, speak, would work speedily. Don't you remember in the lamp stand on and cuts meant that the word of God would work speedily? Now I want you to notice what he's saying here. He's saying don't hide your face from me. How come? Because I remember the works of old. He's saying don't, don't hide from me God because I remember what you did in the tabernacle. I remember how prayer was made. I remember how the odor of incense was lifting up a smoke into your nostrils that you thought was a sweet smelling savor. I remember that God and now because I know that you can't hide from me. Do you see church when we get in prayer in the right way, in the right vein, through the right process, through the right pattern, God cannot do anything more but be faithful unto himself. When we go to prayer, the Bible says that he is a faithful God and he is hearing the prayer and meeting the needs of those who come into his presence. But you must come through the right vein or you will not come at all. There are many people in this country today that are telling you there are many ways to God. I'm telling you that that's a bald-faced lie. And I'll look into the YouTube camera and say that's a bald-faced lie. There is but one way to God. That way is Jesus Christ. There is but one way to get to God. That is the cross of power. There is but one way to get to God. It's through the blood of the Lamb. And when the blood is being smelled by the Father, He welcomes you into His presence. What a great God. Psalms 144, 1 and 2. Now watch what he says now. He says, Blessed be the Lord my strength. Now watch it now. Because in 142, he was beaten. <coughs> in 143, he went back to the old ways. Found God. God revealed himself in the tabernacle. In 144, all of a sudden, he has risen up strong. Watch what he says. He said, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Who is he fighting against? He's fighting a spiritual battle that he is going to win because he has been in the presence of God. All of a sudden, the struggles and trials of life seem so insignificant because now he has risen up in strength and in power and he is ready to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the world that's trying to beat him down. Glory to God. He said, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer. Does that sound like a man who was praying in Psalms 142 about being defeated? No. Because he had been to the old place and found the presence of God. Can we readily see what faith in God has done for us? Yes. Through the, these three divisions of Psalms, life found him in trouble. But when he went back through the correct means, and I want you to see that, when he went back through the correct means and methods, he found a faithful God. Yes. When, we, when he met with God, he had the answers from the throne of God that allowed him to leave the presence of God with the power and authority to subdue the world in which he lived. Now let's look at the tabernacle. Show how it showed his faith and how it was released before God. There are two popular beliefs from Mark chapter 11. The first one in the Greek calls him, refers to God as his faithfulness. Jesus speaking to the disciples said, have faith in God. And some Greek renderings say that have faith in God's Faithfulness, that's good enough. Have faith in God's faithfulness. If all I had to believe in was the fact that God is faithful, that'd be enough for me. That'd be enough for me. Because I would know that if He is faithful 
And I come to him in the right way. Because of his faithfulness, he is going to do what he told me in his word he would do. The second one was, have the faith of God. Now that's significant. That's significant. Because that taught us that God was in the business of exercising faith. Now wait a minute. Someone said, prove that to me. Well, it began in Genesis chapter 1. When the office, the officer, which was Jesus, spoke, the Holy Ghost picked up on that, and the sea moved, and light became, and the earth was. And in a short period of six settings, all that we know was it is. He exercises faith. He lives in faith. Whenever we go to the tabernacle and we see the substance and the evidence, we know that God, now won't you get this, who designed the tabernacle with purpose and intent for his worship and his relationship to the people. Not then, but now as well. How do we know that, Pastor? Because we saw it, as I told you last week, we saw it in Exodus, we saw it in Leviticus, we saw it in Solomon. We saw it in David. We saw it in Nehemiah. We saw it in Esther. Then Paul picked it up. And, and so did Jesus teach about it in the Gospels. Paul picked it up in Hebrews chapter 8 9. And now he comes to 11. And he says these words. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. God has been working in faith from the beginning, and then he took it over into Revelation chapter 5, Revelation chapter 8, and Revelation chapter 15. The tabernacle and faith is the center, is at the center of everything God does. If you're going to get to God, friend, you're going to come by the way of faith. Amen. No other way. Now, so whether God is faithful to complete our faith-filled words, or he offers us faith that has first been tested by his own use is not consequential to the fact that Paul's statement in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 gives us insight into what faith does for us and when faith's expression is important in the process. Here's what he said. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, now see that right there, he that cometh to God, he that cometh to God. What are you doing when you're praying? You're going to God. Hebrews chapter 4 said that you have access into the throne room of God where you can find grace and mercy to help in time of need. You are going to God. Faith is the avenue whereby you go to God. You will never understand the grace of God until you operate it through faith. Why? Because you're saved by grace through faith. So here we are. It is clear to see that both Greek renderings are true. First, faith, uh, uh, the means <coughs> whereby we know God. It's the avenue that God has instilled in every man to allow him to come to him. Now I want to ask you a question. Are you interested in coming to God? Do you have needs big enough for you to desire to go to God? Now that's a question. That's a big question. Or are you self-sufficient? Because God looked at Israel and knew they were not. God looked at mankind and knew that you were not. God sent Jesus into this world because He knew that you had no other means whereby to ever know Him except through faith in the Son of God. This is what the Word said. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth, that means whosoever exercises the divine ability to have faith, whosoever believeth should perish but have everlasting life. Two verses later it said, He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. He that has faith in the Son of God is not condemned, but he that does not operate in faith 
Why? Because you cannot come to God without it. You cannot be rewarded by God without it. You cannot approach God without it. He put it in the altar of incense as a smoke that would burn to tell you that there is a substance and there is an evidence. The substance is your hope. It's Jesus Christ. It's His blood. It's His uh, the Lamb. It's Him as judge. It is Him as King. That is your substance. And your evidence comes out of that because you have believed. And it goes into the smoke. And that faith is something that is so sweet to Him because He knows that His divine plan, His divine order has been followed by one man's heart who has come to know the presence and power of the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now that's good news. The entire process of the tabernacle of prayer is about one thing. Coming to up to or approaching God in the fashion that He demands. That is a secret to this thing. So faith has to be involved. Before I go, I want to show you this though. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, I've quoted it already. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith always bears in its elements the parts of grace that God uses to bring man into a condition. Now watch that. That God uses to bring man into a condition where he becomes recognizable, acceptable, and which fashions him after his dear son in righteousness. Now I'm going to show you something you've never heard before. I'm going to show you something you've never heard before. Watch. The last stand expresses God's favor. We see grace in its unmerited favor. The lampstand tells us about how God's grace worked in the process for you to be redeemed. So in the first phase, in the court of blessing, is the lampstand where it shows us, it shows us God's favor. Now watch the next one. The next one is the lampstand, is the table of showbread. At the table of showbread, because it represents the cross, and it represents the cross being transferred or transported to you. It represents the grace there. Represents the influence of God. Because when you understand that the cross and its blood has been transferred to you, then you can operate under its influence. What does that mean? That means that you can operate and walk in the Spirit. That means that you can operate and have a God that will heal your body. That means that you can operate with a new will. That you can operate under the will of Christ. That means that you can operate under the mind of Christ. That means that you can operate in service in the anointing of Christ. That means that out of His side comes your ability <coughs> to know what your office in the church is. And to be a part of the completed work of the church that is Jesus Christ. And then that also means that every step that you take under the emphasis of the Holy Spirit is directed by the paths of God. So all of the influence of your life in spirituality comes out of that influence of grace that you find in the showbread. Now watch this. Then there is the grace that expresses the way God does things. How does God do things? By grace through faith. Hallelujah. You see it? How does God do what God does? The way God operates is that He operates in man by faith in Him. The way God does things is shown in the honor of incense. And, and there, He is showing man that if you'll come to me with Jesus Christ, and you'll release your faith in Jesus Christ, <coughs> and the smoke will billow up to me in Jesus Christ, there you will find me, and when you find me, you will find out this about me, that every promise in me is yea and amen. Every promise in me is in Jesus Christ. See, we have wanted to put our faith in many different substances. We wanted to put our faith in money. We wanted to put our faith in houses. We wanted to put our faith in cars. We wanted to put our faith in material things. We'd been told by people that all we had to do was believe that we'd drive a Corvette. Bless God. God was sitting on it. It has a whole bunch of them packed around heaven just waiting to send you one. <laughs> 
That's what we've been told. But the truth of the matter is, the reality of the matter is, is that that's not what this thing is about. The promises of God are in one thing. They are in Him. That's all they are. That's all they've ever been. And if you will get in Him and walk by faith in Him, the presence and the promises of God are already appropriate. Someone said, how do you know? Well, Paul told me so. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I have not seen nor ear have heard the things which God has prepared for those who love it. But it has been revealed by my Spirit. You see, church, God is trying to get you to operate and come to Him through the very thing that will open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that you are not able to contain. And it ain't money. It's faith in Jesus Christ. There you go. The grace that expresses the way God does things. Now I want to show you the fourth grace. There's a fourth grace here. The fourth grace is that once you enter <coughs> into the throne of God, and once you come into the Ark of the Covenant, which we'll get to in a couple weeks, you're going to find God in there as a judge. Now I want you to hear me now. You're going to find the grace of God as a judge. What is he judging? He's judging his promises. That's what he's judging. He's judging whether what he said in his word has been already appropriated for the meeting of your need. Well now we know the answer to that. Because on his right hand is the one who appropriated it. Yes, Jesus. So we know the answer the answer is that every promise in the book belongs to me because I have come through the blood of the one who sits in his right hand and is praying for me to get from God what I need. Yes, Jesus. See that? That is the grace of God in judgment. Now you will not get that. You cannot get that. Pray two minutes a day. Putting in your convenient. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. He's going to keep you. You're going to live. You're going to live unsatisfied. You're going to live unfulfilled. You're going to live in a state where you have more questions about God and why you said this God didn't do that God than you do in anything else. You know why? Because you never got to the throne. Because you didn't come through the right way. You didn't use the path. So here he sits as a judge saying to you, yes and amen. Yes! It belongs to you. And amen. Yes! And so be it. See, that's the grace of God in judgment. Now there's going to come a day when the activity of the tabernacle will change. And that same grace of judgment will turn into the grace of punitive judgment. Do you remember how? Now watch it, now watch it, now watch it. Now, now I'm about to tell you something. Watch me now. Do you remember in the spices? How one of the spices was a roaring smell to him? I've said this before. I have to say it again. You have two ways that you will face the God of the universe. In Jesus Christ, you will face him as the lamb from the spices and the lamb from the way. And he will be the light of the judgment of God's blessing upon you, or you will face him, as, face him as the roaring lion of the tribe of Judah, where he looks out over mankind and begins to tell them, here is where you are, and I know you not. There are two pieces of judgment in the throne room. One is the current judgment based on the state of the dispensation of grace to God's people. 
And then there is the second judgment from the throne room that pours out the vials in Revelation 15 as wrath upon the earth. You see, we are sitting under an open heaven where faith and getting to God will allow God to look at your need and say, yes, and so be it. Yes, and so be it. It's for you. The Holy Spirit has brought you this far, and all you have to do is take what I've given to you and receive it unto yourself because it was made for you. See, there's, there's four sides of grace. You never hear about any one of them but the first one. You never hear anything about grace but it's favor. The glory to God when God made grace, favor was not big enough to define how God would treat His people. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Faith is the key. But grace, favor, wasn't big enough. To tell the world what God would do for His people through faith. Now let's look at this real quick. I'm going to be done. I can't. I'm going to stop right there because I knew it would take me two weeks to preach this. Because I got to get to the side, to the substance and the evidence, but I ain't got time for that. I'm going to stop right there. Now I'm going to ask you this question. Listen carefully. Are you praying? Are you praying? That's number one. <coughs> what are you praying? <coughs> when are you praying? And here's the big one. Why are you praying? Why are you praying? Are you praying because you have a need because you're exhibiting faith. You're exhibiting faith when you pray. I showed you that in Revelation 8, Revelation 5. God is hearing your prayer. But why are you praying? You know why I pray? This morning, my prayer started at 4.46. I finished my prayer this morning at 7.45. You know why I pray? Because I want to have a relationship with Him. That's why I pray. You say, Pastor, don't you talk about your needs? That's the last thing on my list. I want to have a relationship with Him. I want to be able to know that when I call on Him, I'm walking into His presence. I'm spending time with Him. He is the focus of my prayer. Jesus Christ is the source of my prayer. But I'm focusing on Him. And by faith, I reach out to Him. And do you know what I hear him say to me? Sometime during the span of time when I'm praying, I hear him say, come on in, friend. Come on in. When I get there, you know what my prayer is? Oh, you're such a great God. You're such a loving God. I bow before you, God. I bow before you, God. I praise you, I worship you, I give myself to you. I bow and surrender myself to you. I have come to you through the blood. I have come to you through the Lamb. I look forward to the Lion because I know that my soul and my spirit is prepared to rest in the bosom of the Almighty God because I know where the secret place is. It is right here right now. I am in it. I live in it. I walk in it. I go into it every day and I worship you, God. And I praise you, God, for the opportunity to be in your presence. And after a while, I'll hear myself begin to pray for other people. And I'll call on God for them. And my faith reaches out and I'll call on the very promise of God for you. 
If you're sick, I will say, God, you know all so and so. But I know this about you. He was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquity. And the chastisement of my peace is upon. And by his stripes I'm healed. So I call on the promise of God. I receive it today for them, God. Your word said I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a promise, God. And I call on that today for them. I ain't praying for myself yet. Because the pattern of prayer is not about me when I get there. Now watch me now, watch me now. Watch me now. It was about me at the brazen altar. Yeah, because that's where I died. It was about me at the labor. Because that's where my spirit was refined. It was about me there. But when I got into the blessing tabernacle, it no longer became about me. No, no. Now it became about my relationship to Him. My union and communion with Him. My prayer no longer worried about the flesh, the sin that I might have done. My prayer no longer concerned itself with my spirit whether I was refined enough to be there because I wouldn't be there unless I were. My prayer all of a sudden began to take in what God has done for me and what God is doing for His people. And I'm calling on God to, pray, to do the faithful thing. And I'm saying, Lord, You're faithful. Your Word said You were faithful. Now, my church has this need. My people have this need. My principal has this need. My board of education has this need. My president has this need. Jamie Red has this need. We have needs. Tommy has a need. Susan has a need. Charlie has a need. Mom has a need. Sharon has a need. God, will you minister? Because your word has promised me that you would. And I walk out of there with the assurance that what I have prayed, God is already on. What I have asked, God is already moving upon. And the Spirit of God gives me a peace that when I walk out of there after giving up three and a half or more hours of sleep, my steps are renewed. My youth is renewed. I feel like I can run over, jump over a mountain and run through a swing because I have been with God. Yes. Hallelujah. See, church, that's where we must get. That's where we must get. Yes. I'm asking you, why are you praying? Why are you praying? Bow your head and close your eyes. Now, Father, I preach the word to these people and it ain't done. But I'm finished for this morning, Father, and I'm asking you to minister in the lives of each one of these that are here. God, I'm asking you to give them a revelation of faith. I'm asking you to give them a revelation of grace. I'm asking you to see in the temple, the tabernacle of blessing in the holy place that grace has favor. That grace has influence in the showbread, in the cross. It'll change life. Grace has the way God does things through faith. And if we never get there, we'll never experience it. And then God sits in the throne under an open heaven of judgment. And His judgment is looking at His Word and saying every promise in Him, my right hand man, is yes and amen. Now you sit there and ask yourself this question. What do you want today? Well, I want to be healed, preacher. Well, I want to be blessed, preacher. Well, I want to have money, preacher. Well, I want to have this, that, or the other, preacher. Well, all I can tell you is, is that everything you want is in there. It's like ragu. Everything you want is in there. It'll taste good. It'll smell good. It'll feel good. It'll make you everything you want to be. But you'll never get it if you don't know how to get there. You'll never get it if you don't know how to live, get there. You can live a fulfilled life and be more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus. Because you'll come there through Him. And you'll get the promises of God through the grace of God that says it's open to you. Or, 
Or, you will live in defeat, shallow. You'll have moments of joy. You'll have moments where it'll be good. You'll have many more moments where it'll be tough, hard, and disappointing. And you'll wonder, where is God? But I'm telling you, there is grace sufficient for your need. There is grace sufficient for your need. Now, who's going to say today, Father, I've heard the Word preached. My spirit has been pricked. I need to come to you through faith. I need to come to you by faith. I need to come to you not looking for my needs to be met, but looking for me to worship and praise you and to be in your presence and let that be my blessing. And when I get there, and the time comes for me to mention my little old need, I know that your word is faithful. And the appropriation of the promises of God have already been up to supplied for me. Now who stands in that today? Can you stand and say, Father, today I come to you in faith. I come to you in faith, Father. I come to you in faith. I, I, I stand today simply to say I receive the Word of God and I believe the Word of God. And by faith today, by faith today, by faith today, let my faith be a sweet-smelling savor in your nostrils as you see Jesus in me. Let me come to the very throne of God and there find grace and mercy to help in my time of need. And there find what it is that I'm lacking as I pray for others before myself, as I seek you for my world, my church, as I'm looking unto you as the author and the finisher of my faith, and I'm seeking you, may I then find my needs to be met. God's open judgment of grace to be yes, and so be it. Say it with me, I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. Raise your hands and say, I take it. I take it today, Father. It, you made this way for me, and I take it. It belongs to me. This pattern belongs to me. The God of the universe is my Papa Daddy, my dear Papa Daddy, and you want me to come into your presence. You long for me to be in your presence. You gave Jesus so that I could be in your presence, and by faith, I'm going. And by faith, I take from the presence of God the need needs being met in my community, in my church, in my family, in my life, in my job, in my finances. I receive it today. Belongs to me. Now I want you to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Thank you, Father. We praise you today and we worship you. You're a great God. You're a mighty God. Your presence, your presence is where you want me. God, if your presence was not where you wanted me, you would have never promised me eternal life. Hallelujah. You would have never promised me that in my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you so. And you would have never told me that you were going to prepare a place for me in that place of many mansions. But you want me in your presence. You want me to be with you. You want me to walk into the throne room of God and take the things out of the throne room of God that you have designed and desired for me to have. Now, Father, it's by faith. Now, God, as I pray for this group, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that their faith would release. Now, God, I want them in their minds I to see this. They brought their substance, Jesus Christ. And they brought the spices about Him. And they put them in the altar of incense. And when the altar of incense was released, when their faith was released, when the substance of their hope was released, Paul said, there's a mystery, and that's Jesus Christ in you, the hope 
to go. As they release their substance to you, may they walk and live in the presence and power of God. May they pray a new prayer. May their heart sing a new song. I praise you today for this church and these people. Bless us. Bless us. Keep us. Bring us back at the appointed hour. And for all of that, we will give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And you may be dismissed, and we will see you Wednesday night. Becky will be teaching.